Wombat poo is shaped in little cubies. They put out 90 of them every night. And the supposed explanation is that they have cube-shaped poos so they don't roll away and can better mark out their territory. If that's the case, why don't all mammals that mark out their territory with their smells have cube-shaped poos? How do they do it? We're not sure. Now, we know there's something different about the wombat gut. Our gut, a tube about 10 meters long, tube, and it's kind of like a balloon. You push in here, you push in there, and it's the same sort of resistance to pushing. In the wombat gut, there's two lines of weakness, one on one side and one on one side, the other side, and we don't know how this makes the poo come out cubical. There's something there we don't know yet. And this is curious because we humans make cubes in industry in only two ways. We either shove smaller stuff together or we just grind away what we don't want. And wombats seem to have a third way. Wouldn't it be interesting that in the future we'll have cubes following the technology of wombat poo? Is there anything to do with their bottoms? Well, sure, this actually is another mystery. How come if they're pooping out cube-shaped poos, how come you don't hear a loud bang every time they have a poo? There are many phobias. I'm scared of spiders. I've finally got to the stage where I can actually get a photograph of a spider and touch it with my finger. That's my phobia. Other people have trypophobia, where they're scared of holes. Why? We're not sure, but many diseases, such as smallpox, which killed 10% of all humans who were alive between the years 1000 and 2000, diseases such as smallpox leave you with all these little holes, all these little pock marks on your body, and so being scared of holes means that you are protected. You see somebody with lots of holes, you run away, and you don't get smallpox. But we're still stuck with the situation today that many people have trypophobia, T-R-Y-P-O, phobia, P-H-O-B-I-A, and that means that they can't eat lotus root in Chinese restaurants, which I love. I'm sorry. Are parallel universes possible? Maybe, and it's a slightly long answer, and here we go. If there's stuff smaller than electrons and quarks, which make up the middle of the atom, what is it? Option number one, it might be smaller stuff. Maybe, we don't know, we never proved it. Option number two, it might be the quantum universe bubbling, creating something out of nothing. Is that true? We don't know. Oh, by the way, you can make something out of nothing in the quantum universe. Option number three, strings. So there are these 10 dimensional strings, which appear in our universe as a one dimensional object. So it's got length, but no this way or that way and vibrations run along it and they make up the quarks and the electrons. If, if the third theory is true, and we don't know if it is, then almost certainly the multiverse is true. Taste buds, how they work? They work the same way that all chemicals work in your body via a lock and key system. So you put a key into a lock and it turns. You have on your taste buds, you have receptors, which are the lock, and the chemicals, which are sweet and salt and sour and bitter, and also umami, they come along and they fit exactly into the key. The key fits exactly into the lock, and then something happens and you go, oh my gosh, I've just had something sweet or sour or bitter or umami. What happens to taste buds when you burn your tongue by having something that is too hot in terms of temperature? Well, unfortunately, the taste buds can die, but you've got others underneath ready to come up. They're based on stem cells, and they're little babies, and they come rising to the surface, and you grow new ones. Don't drink stuff or eat stuff that's too hot. How do you measure the temperature of the sun? Well, the surface is fairly easy. You just look at the light and then you run it into a prism, like on the cover of the Dark Side of the Moon album, where the white light comes in and it gets broken up into a bunch of rainbow shapes, rainbow colors. And then you look at the colors and you'll notice there's some lines there. Mm. And those lines correspond to certain elements, such as hydrogen and helium. And you look at it and say, yeah, they, they look like they're hydrogen and helium, but they're shifted. They're in a different color band. 
and you say, well, let me just get some hydrogen and heat it up until it gets into a different colour band, until it gets where to match up with what we've got in the sun, and you have to heat it up to five and a half thousand degrees before it shifts the same amount. That's how we measure the temperature on the outside of the sun. The inside we do with physics because every second the sun burns 620 million tonnes of hydrogen and turns that into 616 million tonnes of helium and energy and the solar wind. So we measure the temperature on the inside of the sun by physics. We haven't actually sent a probe there, no way. Coral spawning, I've actually seen coral spawning and it's amazing. So coral is an animal that, sorry to be a little bit rude here, eats through its bum. It's only got one hole and the food comes in and it eats the food and then squirts it out again. So it eats with its bum. And it's also an animal that is glued or cemented into one spot, but it's an animal. Even if it doesn't move, it's an animal. And they make babies by just releasing these either eggs or sperm, or eggs and sperm together, or eggs and sperm fertilized, or not fertilized, and they release them out at certain times of the year, depending on the season, the tide, and the full moon. And the sea is sort of covered with this sort of caviar mush. It's really amazing. Unfortunately, in the year 2019, in certain parts of the Great Barrier Reef, the amount of coral spawning went down by not 5%, 95%. Don't worry, we can fix it. We can and we will fix it. Mass of an atom. Well, atoms make up everything, which is, I guess, why I can't trust them, because they make up everything. Oh, God, this is a bad joke. Anyway, it turns out that an atom has got a central bit, which is the nucleus, then lots of empty space, and then the bit on the outside. So think about getting a P and putting it in the middle of the Melbourne Cricket Ground. That's a solid bit in the middle, empty space. Most of the mass of the atom is in that solid bit. And it turns out that only 9% of that is actual mass of fundamental particles. The rest of it is kind of a mass that's caused by congealed energy and weird quantum stuff. So it's mass via equals mc squared. That's so weird, and yet, in your lifetime, it'll be used for a toy that you can tell your children to stop playing with. Why do people think the Earth is flat? Because it, I have no idea. It's really easy. So what you do is you get something like this fine book, Dr. Carl's Random Road Through Two Sides, and then you put two sticks on it. Hold the sticks up with a bit of plasticine, and the sticks are the same length, and blow me down on this flat bit of paper. The shadows are exactly the same length. But then if you curve the book, the shadows are different lengths. And the Greeks and the Egyptians did this experiment 2,000 years ago, where not only did they observe the shadow at the same time in different parts of the world, showing that the Earth was curved, they also measured the diameter of the Earth accurate to within 10%. I don't know, it's as bad as believing the propaganda put out by big tobacco, big alcohol, or, God help me, big fossil fuel. Is there a cure for cancer? Yes and no. Firstly, there's no such single disease as cancer, but there are thousands of cancers corresponding to the hundreds of different cell types in your body. So with your lungs, you can have four different types of cancer. Some of them, you'll be gone in 18 months. Others, it's okay, you can take out a magazine subscription to Utopia or whatever you like. So is there a cure for set cancer? Sometimes it's called the abscopal effect. Ab means away, scope to see, effect. And so here's the story. So a young man in his 20s is having a shower at the gym and one of his friends says, hey, you got a funny black spot on your shoulder. And he goes to the doctor and the doctor says, man, you got a melanoma. Roll forward 18 months and he's just about to die. It's got a happy ending, don't worry. He's just about to die, he's got cancer everywhere through his body and in his bones. He's lost maybe one third to one half his body weight. He's so weak he can't walk. He has to travel in a wheelchair and he's in terrible pain all the time because some of the cancer is in his bones and especially in his lower back. 
So the doctor says, look, we'll try and relieve the pain by spraying your lower back with a huge amount of X-ray radiation. Not to take X-rays, but to kill the cancer there. Yes, it will cause cancer later, but that's not your worry right now. What you want is the pain to go away. So they spray, and by the way, the doctor says, come back and see me if you need any follow-up, thinking you're not gonna survive three weeks. So they spray his back with huge amounts of radiation, and he comes back three weeks later and he says, you know, I'm not feeling any pain, and I, I kind of feel better. And the doctor says, okay, well, we'll come back in another six months. And he comes back in six months, and he's walking. And they do a scan of his body, and the cancer is gone from everywhere in his body. And we don't know how. It's called the abscopal effect. It is very rare. It happens sometimes. We don't know why. It's in one of my previous books. I don't know which one. How fat is the biggest bird? Number one, don't know, but it's start speculating based on an article I read in this month's Scientific American. So the biggest bird that can fly was about 50 kilograms. And birds, by the way, are dinosaurs that managed to survive after the big rock hit and the volcanoes all went off in the Deccan Flats. Different story. But the biggest flying creature was a pterosaur, P-T-E-R-O, saw. Not a dinosaur, a different sort of creature. Now birds, uh, when they're on walking on land, are walking as two-legged creatures. Pterosaurs, on land, walked as four-legged creatures and so they had a big leather scaly wing and they could weigh up to 350 kilograms and they would launch themselves with their four legs, so the legs at the back and also the legs at the front, which were arms, which also held their leather wings. Leather wings have got better flight dynamics than feathers, but they're a lot heavier. 350 kilograms is the answer at this stage. Do fish drink water as they swim through it? Okay, the, here's how you remember it. S for salt water, salt water fish. S for swallow. So seawater, salt water fish do one thing and fresh water fish do the exact opposite. So seawater, salt water fish, salt water fish, swallow lots of water, but make hardly any urine, only about a few percent of their body weight. Freshwater fish are the opposite. Freshwater fish do not swallow hardly any water at all. But they generate 20% of their body weight as urine. What happens? In the salties, the water goes out through their skin and their gills. In the freshies, the water comes in through their skin and their gills. So how to remember it? Salties swallow and then freshies are the opposite. The barcode was invented by Joseph Woodland and took about 30 years to come from thinking about the barcode to actually making it work. See, the trouble was with the grocery shops, they had a lot of items that changed in price and also were low value. So people spent so much time thinking, okay, Vegemite, matches, flour, and they had to look up on a list. And once you got the barcode going, you just sort of go scan, bleep, bingo, the price comes up. And that took 30 years. It was invented by Joe Woodland. Rogue planets. Well, in our solar system, you've got four rocky planets close in, and you've got four big gassy planets, and they're all married to the sun, held in their orbits around the sun by the gravity of the sun. Okay. Number one. Now we go for number two. In our galaxy, there's around 300,000 million stars, and we think that there's about 300,000 million rogue planets. Not married to any star at all, but just careering through the darkness of the Milky Way, orbiting at 200 kilometers a center, 200 kilometers a second around that uh, common center of gravity near the center of the Milky Way. Have we discovered some? A couple of thousand so far. What happens when you've got a phobia? You go into the sympathetic nervous response. You have two 
of these systems designed to keep your body running. You've got dozens, but these two are related. So you've got the sympathetic nervous system response, and that's related to fear, which is related to phobias. F for fear, PH for phobia. Okay, so you come around a corner and there's a killer rabbit. And without even you thinking about it, this giant three meter tall killer rabbit, without even you thinking about it, your pupils close down, your heart rate increases, your adrenaline, adrenal gland starts making adrenaline, so that helps your heart go even faster again. The blood supply to your muscles is increased, so you can fight better. The blood supply to your skin is decreased, so if the killer rabbit bites you, you don't, you don't bleed too much. And this is what happens to people when they experience a phobia. They go into the sympathetic nervous response. As a counter, there's a parasympathetic nervous response, which is you relax. You've had a nice meal, the blood supply to your muscles is decreased, more blood goes to your gut to help digest the food, your pupils um, close down, and you just lie back and relax and have a good time. Cancer is a weird disease, it's where your cells don't normally follow the rule and they start just growing like crazy and elephants get an odd number of cancers. Now what happens is the cancers are more likely to form when either there's something bad in the environment like old oh, sunlight is, causes cancer. Mobile phones do not by the way, they do not and neither do uh, mobile phone towers uh, but sunlight causes cancer and that's one cause of cancer and the other cause of cancer is you just have the gene for it. Regardless of which way you get the cancer, once you've got the cancer then it starts growing. Now another way you get cancer is that you, your cells divide and they make a mistake. And the more your cells will do dividing, the more they've got a chance of getting a cancer. Now an elephant doesn't weigh 70 kilograms or 700, it weighs 7,000. It's got 100 times more cells. So elephants should get 100 times more cancer. No, do they? No, they get a quarter as many. Why? They've got an extra copy of a gene called GP53 that reduces their cancer rate. So all we have to do is genetically modify humans so that every cell has extra copies of GP53 and maybe that'll help fight cancer. Miss Feeney and your wonderful class at Erco Public School, thank you so much for these wonderful questions. Remember, questions are the way to enlightenment. There's an old saying, if you ask a question, you might feel like a fool for a second, but if you don't ask, you'll definitely be foolish forever. And by the way, there are no stupid questions. All questions lead to enlightenment. Ask away. That's how I learn stuff.